Ephesians chapter 2 is where we'll be today. We kind of concluded Ephesians chapter 1 last week and started into Ephesians chapter 2. Actually, it was the week before we kind of concluded and began Ephesians chapter 2 last week as uh, kind of continued on with our study, although there was there's some connection to the previous chapter. Ephesians chapter 2, and as we get started, we'll read verses 1 through verse 7. So Ephesians, there in the New Testament, and uh, kind of about the middle of the New Testament, you find these letters from Paul, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, these letters to churches in these areas. And so here in Ephesians chapter 2, Second chapter, starting in verse 1, we continue on with the speech or the discussion that Paul is having with the Ephesians about our state in Christ and what the estate of the world is. And you hath he quickened, that is made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And we see that phraseology multiple times in the first chapter. It continues in chapter two, that idea of in Christ, through Christ, because of Christ, right? Paul is repeating that. And we talked about last week in those first three verses is where our focus was, about our estate, that is kind of who we were without Christ, right? Paul writes about this being in the past. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He's talking about something in the past because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, the Bible says. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So Paul here writing to a group of born-again believers, born-again Christians, says you were this way. And so we talked about that last week, what our estate was. And he says we were dead in trespasses and sins. Speaking spiritually, right? We were physically alive, but spiritually speaking, we were dead. We were also slaves to the desires of our flesh, the lusts of our flesh, to the kind of the direction of the world, right? We followed what the world says. That's how we lived our lives. And we didn't know anything else, right? And that's much of the world today lives that way. And that's kind of where we're going to continue our focus today. But Paul was talking about who we were. And he said that you walked according to the course of this world, right? That's the desires, the direction, the advice, the counsel, that the world gives, right? The world says what? Follow your heart. What does the Bible say? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the Bible says, basically, don't trust your heart. Your heart will lie to you. And we all kind of know that and realize that. And yet the world constantly says, follow your heart, follow your heart. And that generally leads to heartache as we follow our heart. It, it, it does not lead to the wisest of decisions very often. Uh, many people end up in financial debt and kind of overwhelmed. And really, the Bible even refers to that as slavery because the borrower is slave to the lender. Right? But people end up piling on a bunch of debt because they followed their heart to get this thing. And the world says, yeah, just put it on credit. Just take out a loan for that. You'll be able to pay for it later. Uh, we're having a conversation it was actually yesterday with some people about like university education and the cost kind of world over it seems to continually be going up. And we were speaking in particular about the United States and because a lot of news stories have come out of the U.S., even internationally, those stories are being broadcast about the amount of debt that people are accruing 
just to receive a degree, and many of them a degree that will not allow them a job that can financially even come close to covering the expense. You know, okay, if you end up with $100,000 in debts, U.S. speaking, 100000 with a degree in science or engineering or something, there's potential that you could pay that off. I'm still not advising someone to take out that level of debt that early in life, but there are people with 200, 300, 400,000 US in debt with a degree in, you know, history of South American civilization. You know, look, you might get a good job at Starbucks or someplace like that, but it's not going to cover $400,000 in student debt. And, you know, but what is teaching them to do that? The world, right? The world says, follow your heart, follow your dreams. Everything will just work out. Just, just trust that it'll all work out. The Bible says, look, that's the way that we walked. That's who we were. But Christ changed us. We, we really weren't our own master even then, although we kind of thought that. We were slaves to the desires of our flesh and the direction of the world. And Christ has changed us because in Christ now we have a new master. We are servants of God, servants of Christ. And you say, oh, well, then you're not free. You're a servant. Yeah, but I'm a servant to the most benevolent, loving, gracious, kind, merciful master you could ever have. That's my faith in him is that whatever he directs me to do and wants me to do is going to be for my benefit. He's, he's not going to use me and toss me aside. That's what the world does, right? The world says you're a slave if you follow Christ. But the world just takes people and uses them and tosses them aside. And we see tragedies all around us. They think we're slaves. The truth is they're the slaves. We're following a benevolent, kind, gracious God who loves us, who gave himself for us. Right? He proved that he loved us in that. As we started to talk about this last week, then we continued on with that thought that really that state, who we were at one time before Christ, that is the state of the whole world. And therefore, the world needs to hear the same message that we heard. And if we know Christ and we know that message, then we have a responsibility to tell that to others who are still slaves, who are still in that state. Because the same message that freed us will free them. Now, I know not everyone will receive it, but they need to hear it. And we need to share that message with mercy, with grace, with kindness. Uh, if you keep your place here and move just a little bit forward towards the end of the Bible to 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy chapter 2. So from Ephesians, you have Philippians, Colossians, you have 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and then 1 and 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Paul here is encouraging Timothy. He's a young preacher and he's telling him how he's supposed to act, how he's supposed to live, what is his job as a, as a pastor, as a teacher, as a Christian. Notice what he says in verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. That striving is kind of being argumentative, right? Just railing at people. So the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle, right? So it's giving us that opposite. To strive with someone is not being gracious and gentle. It's, you know, kind of, you need to do this. What's wrong with you? Right? That, that's not the attitude that the servant of the Lord should have. I think we all kind of understand that in some context. We just think, well, yeah, if somebody's a Christian and wants to talk to somebody about the Lord, then it's not necessarily getting right up into somebody's face and yelling and screaming at them. Now, there may be a time and a place for that, right? That sometimes we need to be reminded and hear and 
You know, I know sometimes I need somebody to just get in my face and say, no, no, that is stupid. What's wrong with you, right? So sometimes we need to hear those type of things. But in general, right, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Good to see you guys today. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If you just think about that, that phrasing, oppose themselves. right? What did Paul talk about in Ephesians? That they're walking according to the course of this world and they're, they're following these things and they think that they're free, but they're really slaves. They're, they're opposing themselves. And that's really what sin is. When we commit sin, we're opposing ourselves. We're really just hurting ourselves because sin always destroys. It doesn't matter what the sin is. Go through any list of sins that you find in the Bible and just meditate on those things and you'll see immediately that that never does anything good for me. It always hurts, but we think it's going to bring pleasure and, and it might for a season. We think it's going to satisfy. It never will. We could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And what did Satan say to Eve? Right? He said, oh, God knows that when you eat of this fruit, you're going to be like him. You're going to know good. You're going to know evil. You know, that's why God's keeping this thing from you. There's a good thing that God doesn't want you to have. That is the lie of Satan. That is the lie of sin. This is a good thing that God in his cruel method is keeping from you. He doesn't want you to have this. And what happened when Adam and Eve ate the fruit? <coughs> Was their lives, were their lives immediately and magically better than they were before? No, the exact opposite. Eating that fruit, right, committing that sin brought pain, brought sorrow, brought heartache. It broke their fellowship with God because the Bible tells us, that's an example of it. The Bible tells us in another place in Isaiah that sin has separated between you and your God. So that sin came in, these two people who used to fellowship and walk with God are now separate, not only not fellowshipping with him, what did they do? They hid. They themselves didn't want to fellowship with God anymore. Why? Because now all of a sudden they were ashamed. The Bible talks about that, that they had shame now. So this sin that looked like it's going to do something good. It was going to bring them something that they were mess, missing out on, right? That's often what the world says. You're missing out. Advertisements are filled with that, right? This You need this thing. It, you will be complete when you get whatever it is. You know, whether it's a cheeseburger or this purse or this pair of sunglasses or whatever. That's advertisement. You're incomplete without this thing. And once you have this thing, you're going to be as happy and joyous as everyone else in this advertisement. The, to me, that's one of the greatest lies with a lot of like the advertisements for alcohol and other things. I said, it doesn't matter the sin. But like, what do they always show? People having a good time in that, right? They don't show the baby starving because dad drank all of the money. Right? That's not in the advertisement. Why? Because people wouldn't buy it. Uh, there's actually uh, some, I saw a little bit of it or whatever, uh, a, a YouTube video. It was, they, they had a whole series of these things about different advertisements and industries if they told the truth. And it's somebody like making an ad, but of course it's, you know, this is going to cause your teeth to fall out and your face is going to rot and your skin's going to be leathery. You should buy some now. That. Right, the advertisements aren't filled with that because sin looks attractive. If it wasn't attractive, we wouldn't do it, right? If it didn't appeal to our flesh. And so Paul is talking about these that are lost and, and he says, look, they're opposing themselves. And so we in meekness, with compassion, are supposed to say, look, this is what Christ did for me. I used to live this way and now I don't. Now I have true freedom in Christ. I thought I was free and I wasn't. I was a slave. I was a slave to my flesh. I was a slave to my sins. 
but Christ freed me. He shed his blood on the cross. We're, we're to share the gospel. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very plain and very clear. The first four verses, you could even read a few more and you'll see it. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is, let's just turn there. Rather than me saying, you know, turn over there and read it. The Bible bluntly states that this is the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse number one. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. And that word gospel literally means good news, right? This is the good news. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. As I said, it means good news. That word gospel, uh, for those who speak Bulgarian, it's blagovestie. That's the, the word that's used in the Bulgarian translation which is literally good news. So this is the good news. And Paul says that I preached unto you, which also ye have received. So they accepted this news. They were living by it. Notice what he says in verse two, by which also ye are saved. That is, though they have received that good news, they have believed in it, and now they are saved, right? They are born again. They are a new creature in Christ. If ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So Paul continues on. Now he's going to explain what that gospel is. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Because he said, this is the gospel that I preached unto you, which I myself have received already. So what is that gospel? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Right? That sin that we were slaves to, that we would suffer eternal punishment for, Christ died for it. He died to pay the price because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We'll see that verse in a little bit. <laughs> Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All of that was prophesied in the Old Testament that Christ would do this. He is the fulfillment of, of those prophecies, he is the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior of the world. And the gospel message is that, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He died for our sins. He was buried, proof that he died, right? And then he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. And just to continue on and make a point here, verse number five, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep. So just to kind of put this all together in a nice little box and wrap it up with a bow, the gospel message. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then Paul says he was buried. Why? That's proof that he died, right? Because you don't bury a live person. So he died for our sins according to the scriptures, and then he was buried. Proof that he died. He rose from the dead according to the scriptures. Then he was seen of others, right? That's proof that he rose from the dead. So you kind of see how it, it all fits together. Here's the truth. Here's the proof of it. Here's the truth. Here's the proof of it. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He was seen of Cephas, then of the 12, and of 500 others Paul refers to. And that's the message that the world needs to hear. Because that is salvation. Salvation is in Jesus Christ and belief and trust in the fact that his death paid the price for our sin and that his resurrection offers us eternal life. Because if he didn't rise from the dead, how could we have hoped to rise from the dead? So he's not only our model of all of that, but he also is our savior. He died for our sins. And Paul says, if you believe in that, then you also are saved. That's salvation is in the gospel. And that needs to be shared with others who are opposing themselves, as it says in 2 Timothy. <clears throat> so kind of continuing on with that thought there in Ephesians that we were once in that state and the rest of the world is still in that state and therefore we now have this responsibility to take that message to them. First, we need to believe it ourselves and receive it, but then to carry that message to others. Paul continues then with, I think, some of the most wonderful words in Scripture 
in Ephesians chapter 2, where he ends verse 3, talking about we were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And then verse 4, but God. But God, that, that is an amazing phrase because we were this. We were dead, right? It says at the beginning of the chapter, you had, had to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sins. You walked according to the lust of the world and the lust of your flesh and you were fulfilling your own desires. But God, who is rich in mercy. God, we've talked about this so many times, God so loved the world. I mentioned Romans 6.23 already, for the wages of sin is death. It's, it's a similar verse, similar to the concept that we read here in Ephesians 2. We were dead in trespasses and sin. The wages of sin is death. But Romans 6.23 continues, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a similar concept. Here in Ephesians 2, Paul says we were dead. We were slaves to all of this. But God, who is rich in mercy, and in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's the direction we're all headed. That's what we are already condemned, the Bible says, because we didn't believe on Jesus Christ. We're born into this world as sinners, and so we're condemned because of that sin. But God, who is rich in mercy, or as it says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The bad news is that we were under God's wrath because of our sin. The amazing news, right? That's what makes it the gospel. The good news is Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so we don't have to suffer that punishment. Now, it's a choice. God leaves us. He doesn't force anyone to receive him, doesn't force anyone to receive Jesus Christ, doesn't force anyone to believe the gospel message. But he makes it available. The most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world. Similar concept again, but God who is rich in mercy, but the gift of God is eternal life. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It continues there in verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Sometimes people hear this message and say, oh, you're just condemning me. No, no. God didn't send his son to condemn the world. The Bible says it clearly. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The condemnation was already there. If you continue reading in John 3, it talks about that. It says, we were condemned already because of our sins. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, in his, who is rich in mercy, shows his grace on all who will repent. Right? Ephesians 2 verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. It's because of God's grace because of his mercy, that salvation is available. And again, that word quickened, it's the older usage of it. It means being made alive. That's why he says, you hath quickened, he hath quickened us together with Christ, right? When we were dead in sins, God in his mercy reached down. The truth is God desires that for every man. God has, the Bible says in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of uh, Ezekiel, God there says, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. But God is not this, you know, some sort of like cruel dictator, you know, looking down, just waiting for people to step out of line so he can smack them. You know, he's not up there, he's just batting his hands like, okay, I'm waiting, you know, just step out of line again and I'm... That's, that's not God. He's rich in mercy. He doesn't take pleasure in the death of him that dieth. He has no desire to condemn men to hell. But he's also just. 
And justice demands punishment, right? Demands consequence. It's unjust, right? Somebody commits a crime, whatever that crime is. There's always a punishment, right? That goes with the crime. And if someone commits the crime and a judge just says, I'm feeling nice today, no punishment. Well, everyone would say that's unjust. Right? There's no justice demands satisfaction, right? As in it needs to be made whole, made right. That's the idea of justice. Right? I understand like if somebody kills somebody, you know, you can't replace that lost life, but that's why there is, you know, life imprisonment and other punishments. And that the idea is to one, discourage the crime, but also to, to provide justice. You know, you took the life of this individual, therefore. Your life is now jeopardy, right? You're not going to continue to live however you want to live and do whatever you want to do. You don't have the right to do that. It would be unjust, right? For Let's take murder, for instance. Somebody kills somebody on the street. And let's say it's somebody that we know. They kill someone we know, a friend. Right now, we go through the remainder of, uh, the remainder of our life with the loss of that friend. Let's bring it a step closer what, what if it's a loved one, not just a friend, a family member, a mother, a father, a sister, brother, cousin, right? And we know the individual, they're guilty. It's proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. This individual took the life of our relative. And we sit in a courtroom as the judgment is read out and the judge says, yes, you're guilty, but I'm feeling very kind today. You can go free, go live your life. There would, there would be shouting in that courtroom. Protests against the judge. Right? And we would, right, we would say justice, that this is a miscarriage of justice. Justice has not been meted out. This individual deserves the punishment. They're guilty. God is just. He has to punish them. And that's why Jesus came and took our place. God's justice, God's wrath was meted out on Christ. So that we could go free. The penalty was still paid. And our job then, if we are in Christ, is to share that good news with others. See, God because of his justice, had to send his son. There was no other method of salvation. If there had been another way, and I mean, Jesus even prayed that in the garden. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. Even Jesus prayed that in the garden. If there's another way. Paul talked about it. He said, if, if there was another method of salvation, then Christ is dead in vain. The death of Christ also shows the seriousness of sin. Because the wages of sin is death. And so Paul, as he's writing here in Ephesians, is reminding them of who they are now in Christ, of what they were and the state that the world is in. But also, look, God is rich in mercy and in his grace. And it's because of his mercy and his grace that you're redeemed. Now, therefore, you need to share that with others who are also enslaved. Others who are in the same situation you once were. You need to take this message, the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the message that others need to hear so that they could be freed because God desires all men to be saved. Second Peter chapter three. Towards the end of the Old Testament, New Testament, sorry, not Old Testament. <clears throat> If you hit Revelation, you went too far. Back up a little. Second Peter chapter 3. And in the context here, Peter is talking about the end of the world, the final judgment that God will pour out. And saying how there's many that kind of mock and they say, look, everything's just continuing. You know, I, 
this thing about God and the end of the world. You guys have been saying that for years. And it's never happened. And Peter says, look, it's going to happen. In verse number nine of Second Peter chapter three, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. It's like God will keep his promise. This isn't that, you know, God promised and he's not going to do it. He's saying, look, God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. This is the reason that God hasn't poured out that final judgment, because God is long suffering, right? He's extremely patient to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is God's desire. Because of his great love, he sent his son. He desires all men to be saved. He wants them all to repent, to receive the gospel. Well, praise the Lord that he stepped in in our lives, but he desires to see others come to know him. As I said earlier, the state of all men is they are born sinners and slaves to that sin. And we have a responsibility if we've been freed to carry that truth to others so that they can know the same freedom that we know so that they can be forgiven so that they can walk in the grace and mercy that God's shown so they can know of it and taste of it. We need to tell them that they can be free. And not only that they can be free, but that God desires them to be free because God is love. It's his great mercy. It's his great kindness. It's his long suffering as we see here in in Peter. The fact that God hasn't wiped out the world yet, even though it deserves it, is a testimony to his grace, to his mercy, to his love, to his desire to see men saved. (coughs) Hell is a real place. I was talking with a friend the other day and they were having a, a meeting with somebody who said, you know, I, I, uh, I agree with a lot of the things that you teach, but I just I just can't I, I just can't agree with this idea of hell. And hell is an uncomfortable topic. We don't talk about it a lot necessarily. The Bible paints a very grim picture of hell. A place of eternal torment talks about the worm not dying where flesh is burning but not consumed and it being an eternal thing and that's not a pleasant thought that somebody who would go there for all of eternity now is burning and suffering I, I agree it's not a comfortable thing to think about But the Bible still talks about it. And I know people get into all kinds of philosophical debates that, well, how can, if God is really loving, you know, and I do some sort of sin that's like temporal, right? I I sin once. Then this eternal punishment seems unbalanced. There's multiple things there, though, problems. One is, I don't think we really understand how grievous sin is to God, even just one sin. God promised Adam and Eve in the garden that if they ate of that fruit, they would die. Now, just just stop and think about that. We understand that there are fruits that are poisonous and things like that, right? So we're like, oh, yeah, it might be poisonous. But that wasn't what God was saying there. Like, don't eat this because it's hazardous to your health. God was giving them a command. And he said, if you disobey this command, the punishment's death. Now, just stop and think about that. Because in our mind, we don't necessarily think eating fruit that you've been told not to eat is should be punishable with death. Right. I mean, OK, let's let's not put fruit there because that's not so tempting to most of us. Let's say it's a cookie. Right. No, that that's totally different. Or a piece of cake, pie, whatever. And somebody says, look, don't eat that cookie. Otherwise, you die. 
Look, man, you're a little serious about that cookie, right? It, we would say that, wouldn't we say that's extreme? That the death penalty for eating the fruit, eating the cookie? But we only think that's extreme because we don't understand the seriousness of sin. Because it's not just an action that we do on our, of our own will. It's disregarding what our creator said. The one who owns us, right? He made us. And he's saying, don't do this. And what, what are we saying? I don't care what you say. Against the creator. But it's further than that. We're also saying, I don't believe you. If you really think about the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, it was because of pride. There's a lot of different aspects of it that we could think about and talk about. But at the end of the day, Eve acted based on a lack of faith in what God said. She decided to believe what Satan said versus what God said. So really, her sin was unbelief. And the punishment was spiritual death immediately. They lost the connection with God that they had. Physical death because their bodies began to decay and break down, right? There was no death before them. And not just physical death for them. Think about the world. You went from a place where there was no death. Animals lived in harmony with one another. They were in an environment where, according to scripture, right, they weren't wearing clothing. They weren't ashamed about all of that. But think about the environment where they could actually walk around comfortably without clothing. Most of the places in the world here, even if it's a, a warm climate, if you're outside without clothing, you're going to get sunburned or something else, right? There's it's kind of hazardous to be naked. The environment's not right for it. Right? So there's a whole different world you're talking about. And again, I don't know how much you've thought about those things and the situation and where they were and what that sin cost. It wasn't just death for them. It wasn't just spiritual death. Death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Death entered the world. Disease entered the world. Crime entered the world. It's only a couple chapters later in Genesis where you have the first murder. And it's between brothers. It goes on from that. You have others who commit murder. And by Genesis chapter 6, God says, the world is so wicked. I'm going to send a flood and kill everybody. And while we might look at the world today and say this world is wicked, and I would agree with you 100%. Jesus said at the time of the end, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. So the fact that we're not seeing that time of the end, I think we're moving closer to it. But as wicked as it is now, Jesus said it's going to be like it was in the time of Noah, which means... I don't know that we've reached that level of wickedness yet. And all of that is a result of the fruit that Adam and Eve ate. That's what I mean when I say, I don't think we comprehend really the depth of sin. And so to us, it seems like an unreasonable punishment. But I would go further. The idea of hell being eternal and our sin being only temporal. Look, we've committed more than one sin. Right, God's not just punishing us for one sin. And ultimately, we're rejecting him. And that has an eternal consequence. And God has done everything in his power to make it possible for us to avoid that judgment. So ultimately, if we end up in hell, it's our own decision anyway. Because God, who is rich in mercy, right? But God, who is rich in mercy, showed us his kindness, showed us his mercy, showed us his grace, offered his own son to pay the penalty for our sins so we don't have to. And he did all that because he desired to show that grace to all men. 
He wanted to show us that he still loved us even though we rejected him. And that goes all, again all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve hid from God. God's the one who sought them out. Right? They didn't go seeking God. God sought them. That's love, mercy, and grace. God had every right to just destroy them. They disobeyed his word. They knew what the consequences were and they did it anyway. He had every right to just destroy them. But he sought them out. Not only that, he talked to them about the sin and said, why did you hide? What's going on, right? He wanted them to admit it, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So God sought them out, gave them the opportunity to confess the sin, and then said, I'll provide a way. And that's the message we have to share with others who are in the same trap that we once were. Those that have been taken captive by the devil at his will. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, we didn't read all the passage there in chapter 2. But that's why, of meekness, we should go and we should share that message. God, who is rich in mercy, made that gift available to free us from our sin and then encourages us and tells us, now you go and share that with others so they can be free too. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for your word this afternoon. For the privilege we've had, once again, to at least spend a little bit of time, Lord, away from the world, away from these things. To spend time with you, to read from your word, to learn from it, Lord. Please help us, Lord, to grow in our knowledge of you, our love for you, Lord. Help us to have grace and mercy towards others, to be faithful, to share the truth with others. That they, Lord, might come to know you as Savior as well. Father, we ask all this now in Christ's name. Amen.